Please stand. Our sermon text, the portion of scripture for our meditation this morning is the entire first lesson from Acts chapter 5, but let me just highlight and remind you of a few words. Peter's summary of the power that required and enabled them to defy the Jewish leaders and continue to preach the gospel was Christ's resurrection itself. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. But God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace are yours in the abundant power of Christ's resurrection, dear believers who live by faith in the joy of his resurrection as well as our own. It was the great British preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, who is credited with having this beautiful illustration in one of his sermons describing the gospel of Jesus Christ and his resurrection for us as a mighty, ferocious lion, the king of all beasts. The gospel in the days of Pastor Spurgeon was under attack, just like it was in the time of the apostles in our lesson for this morning, just like the gospel continues to be under attack today. It has been in every age of history. And Spurgeon was concerned that pastors, theologians, and Christians in general in his day were spending too much of their time defending the gospel and not enough time preaching, sharing, evangelizing, telling others about the gospel. Not that defending it wasn't something that should be done. God also commands us to defend his gospel as the apostles did. But Spurgeon thought there was a better way, a better way than spending all of our time coming to the defense of the gospel. And so he compared defending the gospel to more or less the foolishness of jumping in front of a lion at the zoo in order to stop that lion from being attacked. He said there's a better way. There's a better way to defend the gospel. He said in one of his sermons, Stand back. Open the door and let the lion out. I believe that would be the best way of defending him, for he would take care of himself. And the best defense for the gospel is to let the gospel out. Preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. These are wise words in a world where the gospel is continuously under attack. It was true 130 years ago for Pastor Spurgeon. It's true today. It was true in the days of the apostles as well. The gospel is and remains to this day incredibly powerful so that we can be strong and boldly and confidently go out with the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection and share it with everyone. But do you view the gospel as a powerful lion? If you had to pick any animal to represent the gospel's power in your life, what animal would you choose? Maybe you'd pick a faithful dog, that man's best friend, that never asks you questions about things you do. Maybe you would pick the dog that's always with you through thick and thin, who's there to greet you when you get home, who gives you joy in your life, who's never left your side no matter what was going on. Maybe the animal that you picks, pick would be a, a butterfly. You know, after all, the butterfly is a symbol of the resurrection, that beautiful insect coming out of the cocoon after what it was before, a symbol of peace and hope and beauty in a rather ugly world. 
The gospel is certainly all of these things, but we so often forget that the gospel that we believe in and the gospel that's there in our hearts is fiercely powerful, like a lion. And it is because of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ that every Christian carries within them, that we can stand firmly against no matter what attacks come in our way and say, though I am weak, I am strong in Jesus' resurrection. We can so clearly see the power of the gospel at work in the days of the early New Testament church. The gospel was bringing people to faith left and right, working through those apostles and the other people who were sharing the gospel. You can read all about the wonderful things the gospel was doing in the book of Acts, the entire book of Acts, really. You could actually say the entire New Testament. You can see the gospel and how strongly it was working, how ferociously it was at work. But if you're going to crack your Bibles open this afternoon and focus on just a certain part, I would encourage you to read through the first five chapters of the book of Acts and watch how the gospel is at work doing amazing things. We see these apostles, these 12 men, fearlessly going out and preaching the good news about Jesus' resurrection. They almost don't even seem to be like the same men we read about in our gospel lesson this morning. You know the ones who were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jewish leaders? They were totally changed by the power of the gospel. These 12 disciples and hundreds of other people with them had witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. Many of them got to see Jesus between his resurrection on Easter and his ascension into heaven. Jesus met with them and shared with them on several occasions that his death and his resurrection was precisely in fulfillment of everything God had said and prophesied about him in the Old Testament. And armed then with the truth of this resurrection, Jesus gave them their marching orders. They were to stay in Jerusalem until God poured out the Holy Spirit on them in power and then taking that Holy Spirit with them they were to go out in his power and share the wonderful news of Jesus' resurrection, forgiveness in his blood. In this new power from Jesus, the disciples then went out and preached and did many amazing miracles that showed that God's blessing and approval was with them as they told this new news. But the gospel's power wasn't just at work in those 12 men. The Holy Spirit was actively at work through the gospel, bringing many, many people to faith. To faith. We hear in, in those first five chapters of the book of Acts that they started off as a small group, 120, and then it grew 3,000 on Pentecost Day and grew by leaps and bounds. The Lord was adding daily to their number those who were being saved. And not only that, but the people who heard the gospel were so excited to know that their sins had been forgiven that they couldn't get enough of what the apostles were telling them. They got together every day in the temple courts to hear what the disciples had to say and to listen as they showed that Jesus had fulfilled all those prophecies from the Old Testament. You think that we get together quite a bit during Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, twice on Easter Sunday. They were getting together every day of the week to listen to God's word and listen to the apostles. They were excited. They were motivated. And these Christians were no longer hiding in fear. Those Jewish leaders, Jesus' enemies, were still there. They still hated the message that Jesus had to share. They still hated his followers. But they weren't hiding in locked rooms anymore. They weren't quietly shrinking around the city. They were standing out in the open and preaching God's word even in the temple. Peter's words are so impressive and so confident and so defiant when the leaders called them in. We must obey God rather than men. We are witnesses of these things. It was through Christ's command and the power of the Holy Spirit that they were preaching, and they could not help but preach and speak about what they had seen and heard. If the gospel that was at work in them and among them is the same gospel, same powerful gospel that's at work in us 
and among us today, then where, where is the powerful evidence of the gospel at work today? It's still there. The gospel is still there. We have the same gospel as they did 2,000 years ago. Jesus came, suffered, died, and rose again to take away all of your sins, and his death and resurrection assures you of an eternal home in heaven. The good news of Jesus' resurrection at times today, and I'll admit it too, it doesn't seem as fresh and exciting to us as it did to them back then? Is it okay to say that? In your hearts, does the gospel always seem that fresh and exciting? If it doesn't, it's not the fault of the gospel. The gospel hasn't lost its power. It's that our hearts have grown calloused, have grown insensitive because of our love for this life, our love for the things of this world, our putting other things as higher priority than our relationship with the Lord and our eternal salvation in heaven, we have become more concerned and more preoccupied with living life than with eternal life. So then the gospel begins to feel weak and unimportant. Its power has less and less influence in our lives It doesn't change after a while. It doesn't change how we think and how we make our decisions. And we look more and more like the people around us who don't even know their Savior. And we look and act more like them. Rather than being the all-transforming power that sets us free and motivates us to love and serve our Lord and serve our neighbor, the gospel kind of becomes this standby. You know, like the lifeline in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? that you, you use that when you need to call a friend for help. And pretty soon, after treating the gospel that way, it feels like the gospel really isn't much help at all anymore. But another thing to do on this ever-growing to-do list in our lives. But from time to time, thankfully, God reminds us of the power of the gospel in our lives. Often it happens by scratching away at those calluses on our hearts through suffering, pain, loss, falling into some sin. And sadly, it often takes such a great fall or, or such a great pain and suffering and sadness for us to return to our Lord and truly appreciate the comfort and the power of the gospel. Being restored from sin giving us the power to fight against the devil's temptations. This reminds us again of the power that is ours in the gospel. It truly is a powerful lion. It assures us that no matter what sins we have committed, they are forgiven in Jesus' blood. And that marvelous power is just as miraculously at work in our world and in our hearts today as it was back then. Now, the Apostle Paul, in his ministry, was blessed by our Lord to be able to do many different miracles, many of them fantastic, amazing miracles that he was able to do. And yet when the Apostle Paul points to the power of God's gospel in his life, he more often points to a different miracle, not one that Paul was able to do, but a miracle that happened on the road to Damascus. When God took a man who was vehemently persecuting Christians, persecuting Jesus himself, and knocked him flat on his back, spun him around, and turned him into a believer in Jesus as his Savior and God's foremost evangelist and missionary for his church. Spun him around 180 80 degrees. And that, for Paul, was the greatest evidence of his gospel at work that Paul had ever seen, no matter how many people had come to faith from Paul's preaching, no matter how many great miracles he had done, no matter what shipwrecks he had survived, the floggings, even being stoned, all of it, the greatest miracle, the greatest evidence of God's gospel in his life was that God had taken someone dead in his sins and brought him to be a believer, to trust in Jesus as his Savior. And the same evidence of the gospel is right there in your life too. 
What is the greatest work that the gospel has done in you? You might see miracles in your lives. There, you might thank God for answered prayers, and these are great and wonderful blessings from our Lord, but the greatest evidence that the gospel still has the power today to do what it did in the days of the apostles is that God brought you from death in your transgression and sins to be his own dear child, washed your sins away in the waters of baptism, assures you of your forgiveness in his body and blood, and promises you an eternal life of joy in his presence. His gospel is powerfully at work in your life, just as it was in the verses of our gospel, of our first lesson for today, when the angel busted those men out of jail. Can you imagine, though, being there and seeing God do such amazing things as these miracles in, in their lives, too? It would be so exciting, wouldn't it? I mean, these enemies of the gospel, the Jewish leaders, they were absolutely flabbergasted when the servants came back from the jail and they had no idea where the apostles had gone. And the Jewish leaders, they don't even know what to think because these men then who had escaped from jail, they didn't run and hide and try to get away. They went right into the temple courts where everyone can see them and kept doing the exact thing that these Jewish leaders had commanded them not to do. The Jewish leaders had no idea what to think. And then they sent the temple guards out to arrest them, but they can't do it by force. So these men that they had called in question and thrown into jail the night before, now they're going out there and asking him, would you please come back and talk to us a little bit more? Man, how the tables have turned. And then when the apostles get in there to be questioned, the high priest's question almost seems a little bit more defensive. Why are you trying to make us guilty of this man's blood? God has completely turned the tables over on top of them, showing them how weak they are, how weak they were. And really, that should have, that should have raised the hairs on the back of their head. When, they, when those men came back from the prison and said, they're not there, the whole place was still locked, the guards are still standing guard, and we don't know what happened to them. They're just gone that should have made those leaders stop and think, wait a minute, what is this that we are going up against? What amazing power is this? And Peter didn't let them wait for very long without knowing. Man, it would have been great to be there with Peter. I would have loved to have given him a high five after standing up to them, after refusing to budge on the gospel, saying, no, we're not going to stop preaching. We're going to continue to share the power of Jesus' resurrection. I picture it being like one of those events where the, the whole dugout clears out and they're, they're congratulating Peter as he comes around rounds third base after hitting quite a homer. It's just amazing. It would have been so exciting to be there. And this is far more exciting, really, for us, far more meaningful than a player on your team sinking the last second three-pointer to win the game or someone driving home a, a home run to, to, to seal up the victory in the last inning. These, this is our team. The same power that is at work in them, the same faith that they had 2,000 years ago is the faith and the power that is active in your heart today. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. How exciting that truly is. Now, to be honest with you, there probably wasn't much backslapping going on after the disciples left there. See, they didn't make it out of the Sanhedrin unscathed. They were flogged and to commanded not to continue to preach God's word, so probably the backslapping after the flogging didn't go all that well. But they were nonetheless excited, they were nonetheless overjoyed to have endured suffering for the name of their Lord. And they went out and continued to excitedly preach the gospel. Does that excitement infect us as well? As we remember the power of the gospel in our hearts, as we see what the Lord has done for us, as we see his power at work in the words of Scripture, are we excited by that? And what do we do with that excitement once it has filled our hearts as well? Do we you know, just walk back to the dugout, kind of sit down in our, on our bench, take our seats, and 
go back to business as usual? Don't forget that same power that broke them out of prison, that same power that brought 3,000 people to faith in one day is the same power that is at work in your heart. That same power that gave them courage to speak the gospel fearlessly is there within your heart as well, and it will work for you too when you step up to bat for our Lord. Just like these disciples, we have also been sent by our Savior to be His witnesses, to share the good news of His resurrection with others. God has called us, given us positions in life for us to be lights of His resurrection. He has called us to teach our children and to train them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, to teach the good news to all creation. That was an assignment He gave not just to 12 men, but to all of us to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We do all of these things with the same awesome power of Christ's resurrection at work in us just as it was at work in Peter and the rest of the apostles. Power that brings stone-cold hearts to life. Power that washes sins away before God in heaven above. Power that moves people who by nature were enemies of God to promote the gospel and its good news in any way we can with any blessings that God has given us. The angel's words as he set those disciples free are so beautiful and encouraging to us as we witness Christ's resurrection to others. After he had miraculously busted them out of prison, he said to them, go, stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. What is this new life that the angel was talking about? A life of being persecuted? A life of running away from the Jewish leaders? A life of being thrown in jail and spending the night in the slammer? No, no. The angel was talking about the new life that is ours, the new life of forgiveness, freedom from sin, a new life of favor with God, and the joy of an eternal life in heaven that is ours right now. The Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans that we are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection so that just as he is alive, raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. And that's not something that's to come in the future. That's something that is ours right now. We are no longer captives to sin. We are no longer living for the temporary pleasures of this life that don't bring us lasting joy and happiness, but only suffering and punishment. Because you were united with Jesus in his death and resurrection, you can consider yourself dead to sin, but alive in God Alive to God in Christ Jesus, Paul says. The power of the gospel that you share is the key to a new life filled with the joy of being God's beloved child, filled with the joy of knowing that heaven is what awaits you beyond death's door. And you live now without fear of God's punishment, but with the promise of his eternal love for you as your dear father. Now, unbelievers might look at that life and say, you can take it or leave it, it's not much. When they look at our lives, they see that we don't look that much different from them on the outside, often. That's because God doesn't promise that the power of the gospel at work in your hearts is going to keep you from getting sick or keep you from suffering hardships in your life. Christians don't have less suffering in their lives. In fact, God promises us that we can expect to have more. Christians don't have more money after we come to faith. Christians don't have more toys to enjoy in this world. And for that reason, the world looks at this new life that you have and thinks very little of it. But what the gospel does mean in our hearts that you have a joy within you that will not dim or fade as all of these things come and go. The sufferings, the toys, the family, all the blessings that God has given you. The joy never fades in the gospel 
as all of these blessings come and go. Some of you may recognize the name Bill Nye, probably best known by members of my generation as Bill Nye, the science guy. He had a pretty neat television show that was running for quite a while that really got kids interested in the study of science. But he is also a a well-known atheist and an advocate against Christianity. And it was a couple years ago, I remember, that he agreed to a debate uh, between himself and Ken Ham, who has that awesome creation museum down in Kentucky. And Bill Nye's point that he was trying to drive home and defending, among others, was that Christians are making our nation and our children dumber by teaching them about creation, about what God says in the Bible, about creating the entire world and everything that exists in six 24-hour days. Oh, that makes me so mad to hear someone say that. Not only to put down our faith, to put down what God says in His Word, but also then to make Christians sound like bad parents and bad Americans because we are sharing our faith with our children. We're sharing the truth with our children. But thankfully, we don't have to pick apart Bill Nye and his logic point by point and show him where he's wrong. It's a good thing because he is a very intelligent, brilliant man and a scientist. But God calls him a fool. A fool. And we can stand up to such mockery just like the apostles did in the power of the gospel, the power that God has placed in our hearts, the trust in his resurrection that defeats all of the foolishness of this world. We can know that the gospel has the power to change hearts, even hearts that are as mired in unbelief as Bill Nye or the Apostle Paul. Let that lion out of the cage and let the gospel do its work. Preach Christ and him crucified and the gospel will be actively, powerfully at work among us. Amen. Please stand. And now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.